Hello. <laughs> it's great to be here with you all at Agile on the Beach 2018. Who was here last night taking part in the Dev Hops beer? Ah, because my talk is entitled, We Don't Need Another Hero, We Just Need DevOps. I did think about renaming it to uh, Hair of the Dog <laughs> for, for, for those people who might have had a bit too much last night. So my name is Cheryl MacDonald. I work for Nagra Media. We are proudly sponsoring Agile on the Beach this year. And um, my role is Head of Engineering, so I look after our um, platform, our digital TV platform, Engineering. What I'm going to share with you today is a little bit about the case for innovation, how DevOps can remove the need for developer heroics, and how this relates to the Nagra journey. So first of all, a little bit of history about Nagra for people who don't really know much about the organization. This tape recording device behind me was invented in 1951 by our founder, Stefan Kudelski. And it's an analog reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, and it completely transformed the filmmaking industry. It was revolutionary for Hollywood because for the first time, you had a very portable tape recording device. This is just the size of a shoebox that you could move around with, but equally, it had exceptional sound quality. And this became the de facto standard for films made through the 1960s and well into the 1990s. In fact, there was barely a film made in Hollywood that didn't use Nagra recording technology. The, the size of the recording technology meant that we've gone all over the world into the far reaches of the planet and beyond with the recording device. So deep sea research missions to 13,000 feet below sea level, expeditions to the top of Everest, and even it was used in the Apollo missions and went into space. We received a couple of Oscars um, for services to the film in industry as well. But Obviously, you know, if, if this is all we'd ever invented, we would be dead in the water. And so something that's underpinned Nagra's 67-year history is the need to innovate. We've had to transform and diversify our offering in order to keep up with the changes in technology. Our product offering today is digital TV. We have a digital TV platform that allows content providers around the globe to connect with their customers. We also have a line of security products, particularly cyber security products. And we also still do high-end audio equipment, both for the professional and the home market. This is an example of an organization that haven't been able to transform quickly enough. I'm sure you all recognize this brand, once prevalent on our high street, and now no more. Equally, Kodak is another example of a business that just couldn't innovate fast enough. And the world is constantly moving. You know, if we look at how things have changed and the sources of competitive advantage over the last century or so, you can see how much has changed, and that, that rate of change seems to be speeding up more and more. From 1900 to 1960, we had the age of manufacturing. And in this time, if you owned a factory, you owned the market, because you could mass produce your products quicker and cheaper than the competition. From 1960 to 1990, the world started globalizing, and deregulation and free trade meant that you could buy goods in Asia where they were much quicker, uh, much cheaper. And if you were able to move them to your local store, you had cornered the market. 1990 to 2010 was the age of information. And in this age, network computers and the internet meant that businesses could streamline their processes and they could use the internet and the rise of e-commerce to connect directly with their customers. They could run their business processes much more smoothly. So if you could master this new technology, well, you cornered the market. But all of that has changed because in the time we're in now, manufacturing, distribution, information technology has all been commoditized. Anybody can plug into global factories, into global distribution, 
and cloud computing offers all of the computing resources that you could possibly need cheaply and quickly. So it means that there is a huge amount of disruption around because any new entrant into the market can very quickly disrupt. And if an organization that is as old as Nagra is not transforming quickly enough, you will be out of business. So really, in this day and age, the only sustainable competitive advantage is an organization's ability to learn faster than the competition, to innovate. And it's not just about innovating your products. You need to innovate your company, your organizational structure, your processes, your marketing, and how you deliver software. There are some great examples of companies who've been able to come in and disrupt traditional markets. Uh, companies such as Skype, Uber, Airbnb, there are a lot of different examples of these. And you need to be able to, to transform your software delivery processes to avoid catastrophe. I'm sure you all remember a few weeks ago that Visa had a pretty major outage. So, uh, a Europe-wide outage, a hardware failure, caused their system to go down for 10 hours. And in that time, 2.4 million transactions in the UK alone failed. In this, in this age where our society is becoming more and more reliant on digital technology, a catastrophe like this really illustrates how, what a crisis you can find yourself in when you have a system failure. And what do you do? You know, what do you do in this scenario? You, you, your application is down, your customers are screaming, your managers are going into meltdown, you're pulling your hair out, nobody seems to know how you can fix this problem. And all of a sudden, one of your key software engineers gets onto the problem. They start tapping away at the keyboard, staring at the screen, cursing a lot, moaning, drinking lots of coffee, but eventually the problem is fixed. Money is flowing back into your organization, your customers are happy again, management are off your back, and you breathe a sigh of relief. This developer has saved the day once again, and you feel gratitude, you feel great comfort in knowing that they are on your team. You have a software hero. You take great comfort in the, in the fact that they're on your team for times of crisis just like this. But nobody should take comfort from this scenario because it is incredibly dangerous to the organization, and it's not that great for the software engineer either because they're probably under a huge amount of stress. You know, you're, you're applying quick fixes. They, they, they've got a lot of responsibility on their plate. You're probably not looking to the long term. You're not sorting out the root cause of problems. You're putting sticking plasters on it. A huge amount of knowledge is wrapped up in this one software superhero's head because you haven't systematized that knowledge. So if they walk out the door, that knowledge goes with them. So surely there is an, a better way of delivering software. You know, because let's face it, we're all trying to do more with less. And so we need to look for engineering approaches that can help us simply to do much more, but to do it far more accurately, efficiently, and effectively. DevOps is such an approach. Organizations using DevOps are two times more likely to exceed productivity, market share, and profitability goals. Well, who wouldn't want a piece of that? So when we talk about DevOps, it's useful to think about, well, what is DevOps? because there is no one universal definition of DevOps. Everybody has their own personal perspective. And I find this a fascinating question, and I ask it a lot in interview. 
Um, I'm giving my secrets away. If you're looking for a job, we're recruiting. If you come in, that'll be one of your questions. <laughs> But a lot of people say that DevOps is about collaboration between developers and operations, about breaking down the divide and bringing them closer together. Or it's all about automation and automating your processes. And both of those things, to my mind, are the fruit of DevOps. But to me, they're not at the true core, the heart of DevOps. What is at the heart of DevOps is flow. DevOps is all about optimizing the flow of value through your value stream. Agile has obviously been massively transformational to the software development and delivery industry. But really, Agile has been looking at a very small part of the delivery process and the value stream. And that's where the true power of DevOps comes in, because it looks at the full value stream, not just a small part of it. You're optimizing the total value stream, right from the inception of an idea all the way through to the delivery to your customers, and how you operate uh, your platform ultimately. This is what happens when you don't look at the whole value stream. You get development and operations banging against one another. Because fundamentally, developers and operations people want completely different things. On the one hand, developers are tasked by the organization to develop and deploy change, new customer features out to customers. While your operations team, on the other hand, are told to ensure the stability of the platform. And so, when a developer wants to get change to a customer, your operators are going, hang on a minute, you know, wait, wait, wait. We, that change is going to destabilize our system. We don't want that happening. So, they bang up against one another. And from a developer point of view in the past, the definition of done has been code complete or maybe, maybe tested as well. But ultimately, that is their definition of done. And then they chuck the code over the fence to the operations team, and it becomes an operations problem. And when there are problems, nobody takes responsibility because the operations people are saying it's a developer problem, and the developers are saying it's an operations problem. And you can't get the problem solved. So DevOps works to, to, to break down this wall by focusing on the full value stream, by changing the definition of done. Your definition of done becomes running in production rather than just code complete. And therefore, you're tasking your developers and your operations people with both the responsibility for delivery as well as the stability of the platform. So if we look at the value stream, and we want to get to a point where we can optimize our value stream, how do we do that? The best way of working out what your value stream looks like is to model it, to uh, work out what each step of the process from taking, taking that idea through to production, what is each step of that process, put it down, and then go back and look at what are your lead times between each step of the process, and because your lead times essentially are your waste. It's the, it's the time that that task is just sat around doing nothing. Nobody's working on it. And you also map out the time you're actually adding value. So this is a, this is a value stream map example from an organization I worked with previously. And uh, you can see there are a number of handoffs in this fairly typical process of going from planning through to production. And once you've got that all on paper, you can, you can start to see that, great, you know, the total value we're adding in making this change is nine days, just over nine days. The total waste that we're spending when this task, nothing's happening on, is a staggering nine weeks. And once you've worked out this model, you can start to work out, right, well, how do we start improving the efficiency of our pipeline? 
And you can start looking at the low-hanging fruit. Where, where can you optimize the process to reduce that time, to increase the efficiency? You know, and there are a couple of very obvious things in here. Right, you know, we're waiting two weeks because when some code is finished, it's not getting deployed to test until the end of the sprint. Well, why not? You know, why can't we optimize that? Why can't we automate it and do it immediately? We can immediately save two weeks of waste right there. And then another example is, you know, and again, this comes back to the developers and operations who are banging against one another, but you've got a, ch a change request process in place because your operators are going, hang on a minute, you know, if you're going to destabilize the system, I want some assurances that this change isn't going to kill the platform. And of course, there is lead time in that. They want to allow 48 hours, which doesn't seem unreasonable on its own to approve the change request. But all in all, you know, all of these handoffs add to a significant amount of time. And DevOps is about how do we speed up that work stream? And when you're, when you're trying to speed up the work stream, you need to be looking at the principles of flow as a result. So there are some principles and there are some practices behind those principles that if you can implement these in your organization, you will start to see the effect of speeding up your flow. The principles of flow, you want to maximize your flow, obviously, and the way we maximize flow is we reduce waste. We need to reduce those lead times. We need to reduce the inefficiencies in the system using our value stream map. We then want to minimize work in progress because, of course, when you've got people who are working on multiple things at once, well, actually, you know, you're doing 10 things at once, but nothing gets done. Rather work on one thing at a time and move it through all of the stages of development and into production and then start on the next thing. Equally, work in smaller batch sizes. Break down how much code you're writing so that you can speed up that flow. We need to think about the whole system. Obviously, optimizing for different departments is not a good idea. We need to optimize for global goals. Everybody must take responsible responsibility for delivery and stability. And we need to modify our our definition of done, so that done is code running in production. We need to make work visible, because think about it, you know, if you were, if you were trying to optimize a, a, a road traffic system, how would you do it? You certainly wouldn't do it by sitting in your ivory tower and thinking, oh, you know, maybe we could add a lane there or change these lights here without knowing what the flow of traffic was doing. So what you would do is you would analyze it, you would look for the bottlenecks, and then you would try and optimize. And doing this with our work streams is exactly the same thing. We need to have our work visible. And a great way of making work visible is using Kanban boards. So Kanban boards are great because they will show you those bottlenecks, they'll show you where your work's stacking up, they'll show you where tasks are spending a lot of time waiting for, say, a tester or whatever. We need to reduce handoffs. So wherever we're handing off between a couple of different teams, there is always a delay. So try and get rid of your handoffs. And getting rid of handoffs is about automating as much as possible. Because if you can automate that process, well, there's no longer a handoff. And that's where your continuous delivery pipeline comes in to play as well. You want to automate your pipeline so a developer can check in some code that code can automatically undergo a series of automated testing and ultimately get delivered into production in a stable and efficient manner. And finally, create repeatability. So you don't want to be um, doing things multiple times. You want to do something once and you want to codify it so that basically you can just rinse and repeat. You can click a button, you've got infrastructure and configuration in your code, click a button, and your infrastructure is created. And version control, absolutely everything. Your deployment pipeline, your test script, your configuration, your infrastructure, everything. 
so a little bit about the, the, the NAGRA journey in particular. You know, why did we choose to transform? Obviously, there are key reasons in keeping up with competition and in enabling our customers in turn to keep up with the competition. But the, we wanted to be very clear about our goals when we started the, the transformation process. And so what we were trying to achieve was to reduce the cost to deliver and run a TV service. So that's the delivery from us. There is a cost involved there, but also in reducing the cost for our customers because historically we've run a on-premise platform and it is expensive to maintain and it is expensive to deploy. Secondly, we wanted to reduce the amount of time it takes to deploy a TV service from three weeks, which is essentially where we are today on our on-premise installation. It takes roughly three weeks to deploy and configure our platform to just one hour. That is the power of DevOps. And actually, we want, to, we want that to be half an hour, but I didn't really want to put that in writing because I think my manager might watch this presentation. <laughs> And finally, we wanted to be able to release new features and updates more frequently. So again, you know, it's about getting that value to the customer as quickly as possible, keeping up with the competition. So how did we do it? The, the, this, this is quite personal to NAGRA in particular. Um, I'll talk you through some of the practicalities of how we set this up. Obviously, in your own organization, you would have to make your own choices that suited your particular scenario. But we chose to use a concept uh, invented by Google called Site Reliability Engineering. And Site Reliability Engineering, or SRE, actually predates DevOps. Um, but there are a lot of similarities between SRE and DevOps. You know, they're, they're, they're fairly synonymous. Um, fundamentally, Site Reliability Engineering is what happens when you ask a software engineer to design an operations function. Because let's face it, you know, I know quite a lot of developers. I've been one myself, and developers are the laziest people on the planet. <laughs> I hope you don't find that offensive if you're a developer. I mean it in the nicest possible way. But if you give a developer a task to do, a manual task, they're going to do it once. If you give them that same task the next day, they'll write a script. And so what you're doing is you're making infrastructure a software problem. And that is, you know, the, the, the core to SRE. The other thing we did was we, we chose to do it with a dedicated pool of resource. Now, I've worked in organizations who have tried to do a transformation using existing resource who are focusing on BAU and legacy stuff. It doesn't work because inevitably the legacy and the BAU swamp your transformation effort. So I would absolutely advise that you set up a dedicated team to focus on DevOps. And that's not to say that you know, they, they shouldn't be working in col collaboration with the rest of the organization. Absolutely, they should. But when, you, when you're doing a transformation effort, it is very difficult to do that whilst keeping the business running as well. Um, the second thing we did is we, we built our new value stream essentially in parallel to the existing infrastructure. So you've, you've probably got a choice. You, know, you either look at your value stream and you optimize where you can. For us, we wanted to you know, completely change our technology from, from on-premise to the cloud and complete automation. So it made sense to keep our existing pipeline in operation. A lot of that is fairly manual, but we can get our changes out to our existing customers. Alongside that, we've built... Uh, a pipeline in the cloud using automation and slowly we will start to migrate all of our customers onto our new technologies and eventually deprecate the old stuff. We run our applications as services, so we use microservices and so that there is very little uh, dependency between them and ultimately they can be deployed and uh, upgraded in isolation. Continuous delivery is absolutely paramount to automating your process. There was a great talk this morning by David Bryant on the subject. And 
we've built a continuous delivery pipeline to allow us to do that. On-demand creation of all environments, so this goes back to the automation and uh, repeatability of your infrastructure as code, but essentially we, want, we, we've, we can on-demand at the click of a button deploy any environment, dev, test, or production. And we want fast feedback loops. We want feedback, um, you know, we don't want defects passed down further down the stream, but we want that feedback happening as quickly as possible, so that is key to how we work. So this is um, a little look at continuous delivery at NAGRA. This is what our continuous delivery pipeline looks like. Uh, essentially, if you're checking in some code as a, a developer, we're running static code analysis on Sonicube, we're running unit tests, contract tests, and then we're building our do Docker image and uh, deploying that into Artifactory, which is a, a, an Artifactory repository. If we need to run any tests on the deployed environment, we will automatically spin up an AWS environment. We'll run any smoke testing or integration testing on that environment and, and then uh, tear down the environment. And while we're going through the process, we use tagging to tag our artifact through the process. We obviously want to be testing the same uh, thing all the way through the system and, and that's where tagging comes into its own. We go through system testing, performance testing and solution validation and ultimately we can deploy or upgrade to our customers. Some of the technology choices we've made, uh, we're using AWS for our cloud infrastructure. Ansible for infrastructure and code and configuration management. Docker for containerized environments. Kubernetes for our container orchestration and management. And then Jenkins for the automation of our continuous delivery pipeline. There are a host of other technology choices, but these were the ones that we felt fitted and worked best for us. So if, you, if you're thinking about getting started on a... Uh, DevOps transformation. Where, where do you start? Well, I would recommend that you create a dedicated transformation team, working in collaboration with the organization, but you want to give them focus. Agree on a shared goal and mission for that team. Map out your value stream to work out where to concentrate effort. Start small and grow from early successes. You know, when, you're, when you're changing wholesale, from one thing to another, it's, it's a long process and it can be much easier to just start small and find those, those, uh, that low-hanging fruit that you can optimize on. And then practice continuous improvement using metric-based insight. So find out how, where the bottlenecks in your system are, continue going back to your value stream and remapping re it. And remember, there is no DevOps end state. It's a process of continual improvement. So you're never going to get to a point where you go, great, you know, we've done DevOps, we are DevOps. There's no such thing. It is continual improvement. But I think that if you apply some of these tools and techniques, then you really will get to a position where you can more reliably and quickly deploy your software. So focus on... Your, your workflow and optimizing your value stream. You build a culture of collaboration and continuous improvement and use metrics to provide fast feedback loops. And then ultimately, you'll be in a position where you can get your developer superhero to hang up their cape for good. Thank you.